Okay, uh, so let's get started. Uh, today we are very happy to have Professor Tom Liu uh, from the Department of uh, Radiology to give this le uh, guest lecture. And then as you um, already know that I sent an uh, email, uh, you know, have the link about the Tom's the website. You probably get a, you know, a lot of information about him already. So uh, he's currently uh, is the, the director of the USSD Center for uh, Functional MRI. And as you can imagine, you know, his research field is mainly as on the MRI, um, but, uh, uh, you know, um, it's different to our East, you know, engineering school. And we mainly care about the technology, but they mainly care about utilize technology and use it for disease and, 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 and the you know, medical school related topic. So interestingly, and Tom also taught uh, EC187 in the past, right? I remember. Uh, no, I haven't, but I, no, you I, haven't? I, I teach a course in bioengineering, yeah, which is now going to be cross listed in double E, yeah. I see. I think there's something very close to the, you know, to the, uh, the 187 hour department. Uh, so then uh, I think I just want to, you know, make such a very brief introduction and then the rest, though, I will uh, turn it over to Tom. Uh, just a moment. Let's meet. Okay, thanks. Oh, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Do you want me to start now or? Yes, please. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, today we're gonna be talking about three different topics and it's a rather you know small group. So feel free to, you can either interrupt with questions or you can enter it through chat. We'll have a couple of you know very easy polls throughout just to make sure that you know people understand what's going on. So there's three main topics we're gonna to talk about. We're going to give you an overview of functional MRI and what that's about. We're gonna talk about something called diffusion MRI, which is also very important for the sort of work that we do in terms of understanding how the brain works. And then I'm gonna to touch a little bit upon sort of, you know, how things like deep learning are really affecting how we look at MRI and how we reconstruct the images. So you've probably seen in your course already, you know, how MRI can be really used to study anatomy, such as brain anatomy. Um, functional MRI has a slightly different focus, which is really try to understand how does the brain work? What, and what are different parts of the brain doing? How do they interact with each other? Um, what happens in healthy people? What happens in people when they get sick? So that's really the focus of functional MRI. So a functional MRI uh, experiment looks very much like any old, uh, if you just scan someone in the, in the scanner and you place them in the MRI scanner, the main difference is that typically they're doing something. So in this case, they're looking at something on the screen. They might be giving responses through a joystick or through a button box. They might be playing a video game, maybe gambling in the scanner, um, maybe looking at scary pictures. So you're just giving them different tasks to do in the scanner and you're looking at see what their brain does as they do those different tasks. So functional MRI is not too old. It's a little less than 30 years old. Um, Seiji Ogawa was sort of credited with sort of coming up with the basic uh, scientific insight into what underlies the um, fMRI signal. And he coined the term BOLD, which stands for blood oxygenation level dependent signal. And so that's sort of what we're going to be looking at today. And the basic, uh, the, some of the first experiments were they put someone in a scanner and they would shine them a light for a certain period of time. They'd turn the light off and then turn it on again. So repeat that process. And what they found was that um, if they looked at different areas in the brain, say back here in the brain, this is your, in the back of your head is your visual cortex. And they looked at the visual cortex, what they noticed that was that the MR signal would go up and down and up and down in response to the light. Um, and so that was sort of the initial findings. Since, so the initial findings in fMRI were using very simple tasks like either moving your fingers or looking at a light. Since then it's become much more complicated as we'll, we'll see later. Uh, since the invention of fMRI, you know, the research in that area has really taken off you know, in terms of you know, several hundred of thousand publications probably since then. Uh, from all over the world, primarily in the US now, but uh, other countries are also very prolific in, in sort of publishing in the fMRI area. So what distinguishes MRI 
from fMRI. Well, in, maybe in the course already, you've maybe talked a little bit about getting really nice looking images, maybe with very high spec resolution. So this is an example here of a anatomical image that you might get, it would be a whole 3D volume. And it might have a resolution of one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter. That's very standard. Something like that to get a good image would take about six minutes, okay? Um, maybe you could do four minutes if you're willing to use the latest tricks, but typically on that order. And the problem is on, if you're looking at the brain, the brain does a lot within five or six minutes, okay? We've been, we're already five or six minutes into this lecture and, and we've already covered a lot of topics. So that's really not a very good spatial resolution to sort of understand what the brain is doing. So in fMRI, we make a trade-off. We're gonna trade off spatial resolution to get higher temporal resolution. And so state of the art now is we would probably, is a two millimeter isotropic, so eight millimeter cubed, whole brain in uh, less than one second, okay? So that's the trade-off we make. We want to basically get a whole snapshot of the brain um, in one second. Um, the trade-off we make is our volume is about eight times as large as it would be for anatomical imaging. Now, there are techniques that are being developed to try to even push that boundary farther, but that's currently the state of the art, okay? So we're giving up a, some, we're giving quite a bit of uh, spatial resolution up, but we're getting a huge gain going from six minutes to one second it's a huge gain in temporal resolution. The way we do that is um, we use a pulse sequence, which is called echoplanar imaging. And so you might've seen in your course that in MRI, we scan through Fourier space or K space, and typically it's done line by line by line. And that typically takes time. For the echoplanar imaging sequence, we use, we basically zigzag through case space. So we basically go through case space very quickly all in one shot. And with, with modern technologies, we can typically do that within about 30 milliseconds, okay? And so that's fast enough such that before the signal decays away, um, we're able to capture the information we need. And so we do that slice by slice by slice and then acquire the whole brain in that sense. So this is sort of a, we're gonna go through sort of what like an fMRI uh, experiment would look like. Typically we will still acquire an MR, uh, a sort of high resolution anatomical because we do need something to sort of uh, know where we are in the brain. So we still want some high resolution anatomical, but then we'll follow that up with a series of low resolution images where as the subject is looking at a stimulus. So for example, we might have a subject looking at a stimulus that's going on and off the flashing checkerboard we're gonna acquire a series of images. So we're gonna have a 4D volume, 3D in space, 1D in time. So essentially a four dimensional uh, data set that we're gonna look at. And then what we do is we can very simply, the, the most basic analysis is we can ask the question, this is sort of the stimulus we gave, right? It's going up and down and up and down. So we might ask ourselves the question, you know, what areas in the brain are also showing MR signal that goes up and down and up and down? And we can do that with a correlation analysis. And so in this case, we're, we're correlating every um, voxel in the brain with a stimulus pattern. And the areas that sort of light up are those that have a rather high correlation with the stimulus. And so uh, for a very basic analysis, you would say, well, these are the areas of the brain that are associated with this uh, stimulus. This was another experiment where the person was tapping uh, their right hand. And so you're seeing, uh, because your right hand goes to your left motor cortex, you're seeing the signal light up in the inner left motor cortex here. So I wanna talk a little about bold contrast. So this slide we saw before, but now we're zooming in on this. And you probably talked a little bit about TE or echo time. Okay, so echo time in MRI is typically where you acquire the center of case space. So it's sort of where you sort of acquire the bulk of your, your signal. And so what they found in these early studies was that um, if they acquired an echo time of 40 milliseconds, they got quite a robust response. And if they acquired an echo time of eight milliseconds, the response was not as robust. 
So it does seem that the signal is dependent on when you acquire it after the uh, RF excitation. And so we want to talk a little bit about why that might be the case. So to do that, we're going to review sort of the concept of R2 star or T2 star decay. So R2 star is what's called the effective transverse relaxation rate. Uh, it's one over T2 star. So you've probably already seen uh, T2 decay in, your, in the course. Uh, and you may have talked a little bit about T2 prime as well. So there's actually two main sources of, of the decay of transverse relaxation in MRI. One is T2, which is sort of the random motion of spins, which is something that's not really reversible. Um, then there's T2 prime, which is due to sort of static homogeneities, things that um, are causing perturbations of the magnetic field in a way that could be reversible with a spin echo pulse sequence. Uh, for fMRI, we mostly focus on this, okay? So we're really not looking at, we, you, there is an effect due to the random motion of spins, but it tends to be fairly small. So the main effect we're going to look for is what are the, some things that perturb the magnetic field and how can we use that to sort of study how the brain works. So we're going to review a little bit just to remind you that one of the key thick factors in MRI is that spins process around the local magnetic field. Okay. And they process at a frequency known as the Larmor frequency. So omega would be equal to gamma, where gamma is the gyromagnetic ratio, times the B field. Okay. And what's important for fMRI is to know that they're sensitive to the local B field. So the B field is different in two different places. The spins will process at different frequencies in different places. So we're going to do a thought experiment. We're going to imagine that the, at the start of an experiment, after the RF pulse excites the magnetization, we have the spins all aligned here. Okay, they all have, let's say, phase of zero, right? They're all at zero phase. Okay, they're all pointing in the same direction. So the, the sort of this, that's the status of the magnetization after at the beginning of the, the experiment. And then we watch what happens as these spins. The, the spins we assume are in the presence of this perturbed magnetic field, okay, where the different colors are showing that different spins are experiencing different magnetic fields. So if we come back sometime later at echo time, we're going to notice that different spins have either acquired phase or lag behind and lost phase, okay? And so we think of summing up the vector sum of all those spins, we're going to have a smaller signal. And so therefore there's going to be some decay. We've gone from a, a larger signal to a smaller signal due to that dephasing. Now we repeat the experiment in the presence of even more inhogeneity. So now we've increased the, the sort of the, the difference in magnetic fields that different spins might experience. Then at, when we come back at, to, do, to look at where the spins are at echo time, we're gonna see even more dephasing and therefore there's gonna be even more of a decrease in the MR signal, okay? So that's really the cause of T2 star decay uh, in, in fMRI. And we're, then we're gonna look at what are the reasons for that. Um, but before we go into the physiology a little bit, we're going to say that that means that we can sort of model a baseline signal as, you know, some equilibrium magnetization times this exponential decay where we acquire the data at some echo time TE, okay? And in baseline, it has some relaxation rate R2 star B. So it's going to have this exponential decay as a function of, of time. Then during activation, typically what we see is uh, the activation signal, the R2 star has changed. Okay, so there's a change in the transverse relaxation rate such that in a typical fMRI signal, we actually see this happen. So actually R2 star of A is actually gonna be less than R2 star of B. So this is the activation when you're doing the task and this would be baseline. Okay, so since the relaxation rate goes down with activity, we see that that exponential decays less slowly and therefore, oh, sorry about that. But so then if we look at the percent change, which is SA minus SB over the baseline signal, uh, it can be shown that that's roughly proportional to minus the echo time times delta R2 star. Remember delta R2 star typically is less than zero. So this whole thing will be greater than zero, All right? So, which makes sense. We're going from this signal to this signal. So we're expecting a percent increase 
as the relaxation rate becomes less. So now the question is, why does the relaxation rate change when the brain is doing something? So we need to sort of go back and, 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 and sort of remember that what carries oxygen in the blood is the, the hemoglobin molecule, okay? And what happens in the lungs, that hemoglobin molecule picks up the, the uh, O2 atom. So these are like the O2 sort of um, the oxygen and that binds to the hemoglobin, okay? It carries the oxygen up from the lungs the heart pumps it up into their brain and the brain starts using up the oxygen to supply energy. And as it does that, it, expire, it exposes these iron atoms, okay? So at the core of these hemoglobin molecules are four iron atoms. And so iron, as you remember, uh, you know, is a magnetic material. And so it's gonna perturb the magnetic field around it. So the more deoxyhemoglobin, the more iron there is, the more the magnetic field is going to be perturbed. Right. So if we repeat our experiment now, showing that the hemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin is causing the field perturbations, if there's mostly oxyhemoglobin, then there's going to be some dephasing. There does be a little bit iron exposed. So there would be some signal decrease. Okay. But if there's a lot more uh, iron exposed, in this case, you see a lot more sort of blue dots exposed here, then there's gonna be a lot more dephasing. So the more deoxyhemoglobin there is, there's gonna be more dephasing, there's gonna be a decrease in the MR signal, and therefore there's gonna be a higher R2 star. Things are gonna relax much more quickly or decay much more quickly when there's more iron, okay? And so that's sort of relating, sort of the fundamental physiology between the functional MRI signal is really related to how much deoxyhemoglobin there is um, in the blood. Why does the exposure of the iron matter, isn't the iron still present even if it's bound to the oxygen? So that's a great question. So the question is, um, you know, why does it matter whether the oxygen is there or not? The reason it matters is because the oxygen actually forms like a shield. It sort of cages the iron such that the iron can't really uh, perturb the magnetic field around as much. Okay, okay so we're going to get very, very basic physiology here. So what keeps you going, what allows you to watch this lecture, is the fact that the brain delivers blood flow, is de constantly delivering oxygen to your brain, okay? And in the meantime, you're using up that oxygen to, su to supply neural activity, to keep your, you know, as, you're, as you think and you do activity, you're using up the oxygen. So it's the competition between those two, two things. You have supply and demand, okay? And so we think about the two things, the more blood flow there is, which is stands for CBF, stands for cerebral blood flow, then that's gonna try to drive the oxygen down, right? Because there's more oxygen, right? And if there's more oxygen met 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 metabolism, which is, this is CMRO2 stands for the cerebral, cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, that's gonna to tend to drive deoxyhemoglobin levels up. So you have these two things. One's gonna to try to make deoxyhemoglobin down, one's gonna make deoxyhemoglobin go up, okay? It turns out that overall with most brain activity, deoxyhemoglobin levels go down, okay? So it turns out that CBF sort of wins out. And what it turns out is biologically, the percent change in CBF over the percent change uh, in CMO2, is roughly a factor of two, okay? So it's like for every sort of 1% increase in your metabolic rate, the brain is set up, you know, over many thousands of millions of years of evolution to deliver twice as much oxygen as you need, okay? And so that's why we have this bold effect that from a physiological point of view, it turns out that, um, you know, the brain never wants you to be sort of low on oxygen. So it's gonna overcompensate uh, quite a bit typically a two to one to three to one ratio, especially for the sensory areas, like the visual cortex, your motor cortex. Imagine you're walking through the jungle, a tiger comes out, you've got to run, you know, and get away, or you have to fight. The brain, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, the, you know, your brain better have enough oxygen to survive. And so there's no, they don't want, it, it seems like it has been set up to make sure that under no circumstances, you know, are you going to be sort of low on oxygen uh, unless you have 
you know, some injury like a stroke or something like that, okay? So this cartoon, this is one of my grad students made this up a long time ago, um, sort of summarizes sort of the, the fMRI uh, effect. So we have cerebral blood flow bringing in oxygen and CMR2 using up oxygen. The red is representing the oxyhemoglobin and the blue is representing the deoxyhemoglobin. And so blood flows into through the arterioles, oxygen is used up in the capillary beds and then the blood flows out through the venules goes to the veins, back to the heart, and then the whole cycle begins again. So what typically happens is, you know, let's say you start thinking or doing some activity. So there's going to be an increase in neural activity. So therefore, you're going to use up more oxygen. And that's going to lead to more deoxyhemoglobin initially. And, and, and in fact, you can, if you're very careful, you actually see what's called an initial dip in the MRI signal um, right as you're starting a neural activity. But very quickly, the brain doesn't wait around and it actually increases the blood flow by this two to one ratio, such that now you end up with much more oxyhemoglobin and therefore the bold signal is gonna go up. After you end your activity, then they, the bold signal comes down and sometimes it, there's a post, there's an overshoot. The reasons for that are actually still not known. It's still an area of research, but eventually it does come back down again to baseline. But for most fMRI, we're really focused on this, this positive increase. Um, we do see negative increases in some cases, but by and large, it's mostly positive increases uh, when the brain is using up more, um, uh, is, is doing more neural activity. Okay, so what I'd like to do is um, just probably do two of these questions. So let's do the first question. And so the question is the magnitude of the bold signal percent change will either increase or decrease as a function of the echo time. So go ahead and just, uh, if you could just respond to that. Okay, about 20 more seconds if you could sort of the last few people could sort of respond. Just take your best guess as you know, this is not, this is just to sort of see where if, if there's any concepts that we need to clarify. Okay, let's go ahead and, and take a look at sort of the responses here. Um, I'll share the results. So most people pick decrease, okay? Um, but remember, you know, so some of those initial graphs we saw where I had something at eight milliseconds and something at 40 milliseconds and the one at 40 milliseconds showed an increase and the eight, one at eight milliseconds didn't really show an increase. So even from the experimental data, we would expect as we increase echo time, the magnitude of the bold signal experimental at least does increase, okay? And then if we compare looking at those two exponentials, you know, changing, uh, we found out that the percent change, right, was approximately equal to minus delta R2 star times echo time. So this, as the echo time increases, then that percent change will also increase. So it does turn out that up to a certain limit, increasing echo time makes the percent change bigger. Now, those of you said who decrease are actually in, in some ways correct, because if you make the echo time too long, then everything decays away and you have no signal left at all. So that's also not good. So, uh, but as long as you're in the range where, you know, you still have signal, then increasing the echo time is good for getting more bold percent increase. Okay. Is there any questions on that? Okay. Let's do one more question. Um, so let's do the second question. So the question is an increase in the functional CBF where CBF is cerebral blood flow response will tend to either increase or decrease the bold signal. So go ahead and take a look at that and respond. <laughs> 
Okay, about another 10 seconds and we'll close the poll. Okay, so let's look at the results here. So in this case, most people uh, said that it would increase and, and that is correct. So um, it does increase because as there's more blood flow, there's more oxygen, right? So there's gonna drive the deoxymilogram level down. There'll be less dephasing and therefore the MR signal will go up. And the last question would be if the functional CMR2 signal went up, then that would tend to decrease the bolt signal because that would cause more deoxyhemoglobin, right? So that's really about the physiology of fMRI. And what I'm gonna do next is talk about some, some bit about sort of applications, uh, just to give you a sense of what can be done. fMRI is a huge field. So, um, you know, this is just a very small sort of slice through what you can do with fMRI, but it is at least now the best way we have at measuring brain function um, in vivo um, in real time uh, with sort of the spatial resolution that you need and the depth. So, you know, this, this uh, comic by Mac Gronig uh, for The Simpsons, you know, was sort of, he probably wrote it in jest, but if you look at sort of every brain region he's outlined, pretty much everything that he wrote has been done, okay? And I think, you know, obviously I'm not sure there's been an fMRI study of donuts in particular. Um, so at least when I did this slide there, if I, you know, if I searched on donut and fMRI, there was nothing that showed up. But there is a lot of work, including a lot of work being done here at UCSD, where we are using, they're using fMRI to look at eating disorders and obesity and, and how do people, you know, deal with, uh, you know, appetite and, and urges like that. Uh, this is probably one of my more favorite fMRI studies. There's a lot of really interesting fMRI studies out there, but I think this one is really interesting in the sense that, you know, we can sort of all relate to this, which is the, the experiment was done where they, um, they gave people wine and they sort of gave them in the same cups or glasses. And in some cases they were told the wine costs $90. In other cases they were told the wine cost $10. And then they're asked to rate how much they liked the wine. And so you can see when the wine costs $90, they like it a lot more than when they're told it costs $10. And mind you, this is the same wine. So it sort of tastes, should taste exactly the same, uh, but um, they like it much more. Similarly, if you told it's only cost 45 versus $5, uh, there's a big sort of gap in how much you like it. So what they did was they did this experiment while, while people were in the scanner and, and, the, and they looked at areas of the brain that are known to be very important for reward in terms of that really light up when you feel like you're getting a reward. And so you can sort of see when you're given, uh, in this case, the $45 wine, you know, there is a positive response in this reward area. And when you're told that it's, $5, then there's a much weaker response. And in fact, you could even argue there's a negative response at some point where you're, you're actually not getting pleasure um, from this wine, even though all your, it's the same wine, but you're just told that it costs less. Um, and th the difference is even more striking when it's sort of $90 versus $10 wine. You really see a big dramatic change in, in sort of um, uh, the, the biological response to wine. And so this is why, you know, so this is showing sort of biologically that there really is something different in your sort of, uh, your brain's assessment of this wine. And, and this is something that uh, people who are trying to sell you things take advantage of all the time, because they know that if they price something higher, you'll actually get more satisfaction from that. And you're willing to pay more uh, for something if, if the price is signaling that it's a better deal. So uh, this is something that is sort of interesting um, and so there's a, even a whole area called neuroeconomics where they actually use fMRI and other techniques to understand how people make economic decisions based on their brains. Okay. Uh, Tom, can I have a question? Sure. Just about the wine. So then, uh, so then uh, before you do the test, you know, you, you should let the, uh, you know, the person know the price of the wine or you, you, you don't let them know. No, they're told the price. They're they're told that they're either drinking ninety dollar wine or they're told that they're drinking ten dollar wine. Okay, which means the signal might be very complicated, and then you you really don't know their signals from their uh, mind or mainly from their like uh, you know tasting you know motor or you know. Well, right. I mean, the the wine is exactly the same wine, right? So. But, oh, 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 sorry. Okay, exactly the same wine. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. The wine is the same. Um, 
But this okay. is why, you know, so like if you go to Trader Joe's, one of the Trader Joe's things was they, they you know, would try to sell you, you know, it would sell very cheap wine, right? But, yeah. okay. but still you find places that sell very expensive wines. And so part of it is because um, the mine gives value to the price. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Right? That's how well you can buy, you know, some, why is someone willing to buy, pay, you know, $5,000 for like a handbag, right? Which you could get for $50, right? Because part yeah. of it is they, they get, yeah. there is some satisfaction from the price. So then this is one of like the exactly the same wine. You tell them the price are different. Yes. And if you can do another, uh, you know, comparison and then you don't tell them anything, you just give them two uh, uh, wine, two types of different, uh, you know, wine. I, I, I don't know whether this will be helpful. But, and yeah, I, I don't think I did this, this an experiment, but, you know, certainly, and I'm not a wine expert either, but, you know, I, I you know, I, I think that that would be then more whether they can differentiate taste in wine. So this is more just sort of the fact that, you know, what you think about something has a big effect on your perception of it, which is a very common theme in psychology and brain science that we don't really see the world as it is. We see the world as we think it is. So that means, yeah, that this means, let, let's see if you, 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 know, you get the COVID-19 or something and people want to get the vaccine. You just tell them, okay, this vaccine costs like $5,000 and then it's really expensive, it's very well developed, develop all of this kind of positive things. And then that will help the patient to recover much quicker, right? In principle. Maybe, I don't know. I think that with vaccine, it's obviously much more complicated issue. Yeah, true, but <laughs> okay. No. I think with luxury items, pricing definitely works. Uh, with essential items, it probably doesn't work as well. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, another cool application is mind reading, uh, which is basically they are able to, you know, uh, sort of put the person in the scanner and have them watch a movie or look at pictures. And then from the signal that they measure in the brain, try to recreate what the person is seeing. So this is a movie where you can sort of see on the, here's the movie, and then here is, um, you know, what they, they think, trying to recreate what they're seeing. So it's not perfect, and you can sort of look at the YouTube video on your own and sort of judge whether it's good or not. Um, here's a more recent work, whoops, where they're just showing pictures. So these are the pictures on top, and um, I forget, these are the different algorithms that they're probably using. So you can sort of see that it's it's not bad. I mean, it's at least getting the overall shape of, of the object and, and you could maybe differentiate between animals and, and objects. Um, but it's still quite remarkable that, you know, given the sort of the coarseness of the brain imaging that we're doing, um, that you can actually start to um, recreate what the brain is, is imagining. And, and so I think this will continue probably to be an area where, um, you know, for better or worse, people are going to try to figure out how we can read each other's minds. So, uh, can yes. I? Uh, sure. So the, uh, the reconstruction accuracy. Do you think there's somehow related to, uh, you know, the uh, the MRI, the accuracy, you know, the um, the spatial resolution of the MRI? I think that's a good question. I mean, it it, it probably is because um, you know they're basically. You know, they, they first show a bunch of training pictures to get sort of the, the basis functions, and then they project that onto whatever signal they're seeing. So I think there is going to be, you know, um, part of it probably is the resolution of the fMRI. Um, and um, so I would imagine that uh, in the coming years, those pictures will get better. Right. The training, the, the training data have to have the much better accuracy than the actual uh, the data, right? Um, yeah, I don't remember that for those that, that what what kind of training accuracy they were getting, um, but um, you know, I'm not I'm not sure they were getting. I mean, it's, with biological experiments, the, you know, the training accuracy isn't going to be that high. I mean, it's never going to be like, you know, in the ninety or eight hundred percent. But I think they they maximized it. So it's different to classify versus actually create a good looking image, right? So I don't remember what their actual loss metric was. You know, so if simply they want to classify like objects versus animals, this is probably good enough, right? But to actually say whether something's a, a, an owl versus a cheetah versus a looks like a grouse or a quail, it might be good enough. So for classification, it might be just good enough, but for actually a nice looking image, it's, it's clearly not there. So it's getting very close though. <laughs>
The other sort of interesting that thing that sort of uh, people have been trying to do with fMRI is what's called real-time fMRI. Um, it's basically a sort of very expensive form of biofeedback where, um, well, we can start doing an experiment now. So I'd like each of you to um, think about your brain and if you can increase the bold signal in your um, amygdala, go ahead and do that. Okay. And then now go ahead and try to decrease the bold signal in your hippocampus. Okay. And now go ahead and increase the bold signal in your insula. So first of all, you probably don't know what those, you may or may not know what those terms mean. And even if you did, it might be difficult to figure out, you know, how do you actually, you know how to move your hand, but it's very different to sort of say change a blood signal in your brain. But it turns out if I give you feedback, if I just show you what the signal is in your brain, you can actually learn to move it up and down um, just by getting that feedback. And that's what that real, time fMRI is that we will show someone, let's say we pick this area of the brain and we show them the signal and it's going up and down and up and down. And we can actually tell them, okay, now that you sort of see what that signal level is, you, I, we, we would like you to make that signal go up and down and up and down. And it turns out that people can actually do this. They can actually, this is a, a subject actually making the signal in the part of their brain go up and down and up and down. And so there's been a lot of hope or, 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 you know, sort of potential of this to maybe people can learn how to train their brains better, maybe control their pain or, you know, other types of mental, you know, issues better. Uh, although it's, it's, I would have to say that um, it's, it's still at the point now where it's not clear how effective this is. And, and there might be much cheaper approaches such as, for example, meditation or mindfulness that can do actually better um, than actually training people in the brain with this. So, so far we've talked about task-related fMRI where we're actually having the subject doing a task, for example, in this case, opening or closing their eyes. But I do wanna talk a little bit about something called resting state fMRI. And this is essentially where we just put the person in the MRI scanner and we either have them close their eyes or, or maybe open their eyes and look at a, uh, a, you know, a fixation cross and we just scan them and they're not doing anything explicitly. Um, and we look at what their brain is doing. So this is a movie of the fMRI signals of, from someone's brain. And you can sort of see it's just sort of appears to be randomly fluctuating. Um, and in fact, if you're to look at any one area of the brain and look at its signal, it would just appear to be fairly random, okay? But it turns out that there's a lot of structure in that signal. For example, one way I could map the motor cortex is I could have you tap your fingers and then I could say, what areas in the brain map this stimulus? And we would end up with a brain map that looks like that. So this is showing you the left and right motor cortices, okay? But the other thing I could do is I could just have you line the scanner and not do anything. And I would see, for example, in this area of the brain, I might see uh, the blue signal here, okay? Which is going up and down sort of randomly. But then if I looked over here uh, on the other side, I might look at the green signal. So let's say this is green, this is blue. And you'll notice that those two signals are actually highly correlated. So it turns out that um, the brain is actually in sync across functional areas. And the way we can do that is what we could do is we could take the signal from one area of the brain and correlate it with every signal in all the other parts of the brain. And in this case, we get this map here, which looks very similar to the map we would get if they're actually doing a task, okay? There's a question, how do they do this? Do the subjects think of specific things to control it like this? That's a great question. And I would have to say that there's, um, there's typically two conditions. One is we just tell the person to lie in the scanner, close their eyes, keep their eyes closed and just relax and, and try not to think of anything, but obviously people will think of things. And, and so it's not a very well controlled experiment. The other thing we do is um, we have a person lie with their eyes open and maybe look at a, a white screen with like a little cross in it and sort of say, just stare at that cross and try not to think about anything. So it's not really a resting state. I mean, even looking at a cross for five or 10 minutes can be quite challenging, but it's really not. So it is trying to capture someone in sort of their sort of, you know, not quite daydreaming, but sort of the state you're in where you're not really doing anything. And it turns out, even though it's not very well controlled, we can sort of see a lot of variability across people. In fact, uh, we can predict, for example, in IQ scores and, and different factors just by looking at this signal.
Uh, and so since you know this this area has really taken off, uh, it is really now one of the primary ways that we study the brain. And, and it turns out that using these resting state signals, you can identify lots of different networks like visual, sensory motor, auditory, attention, something called the default mode network, something called the control network. And so all these areas, so the way to think about your brain is you have all these networks that are all active and talking to each other. And you know, um, in certain diseases, these networks are impaired. Um, for example, in depression, the default mode network tends to be too active. You know, you're thinking too much about yourself. And so there are approaches where people are looking at, okay, can we come up with therapies that reduce the activity or the connectivity in the default mode network? For example, it's been sure that if you meditate, you can sort of decrease your default mode network activity. And um, so that's, that's an area that's very interesting. Okay, so we're gonna, that's all we're gonna do for fMRI. So um, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat, but we're gonna move on to uh, another approach for looking at the brain, which is also really very prevalent now, and, and, and um, which is basically using diffusion to map out the wiring in the brain. So, so far we've talked about how the brain functions. Now we're gonna talk about how the brain has, is wired together. So you imagine the brain is, you've got a lot of neurons that are doing sort of the neural computation, but there's a lot of white matter, uh, sort of these nerve long axons, nerve cells that have to connect different brain regions to each other. And that's what we're gonna use this thing called diffusion to look at how is the brain wired. Okay. So those of you may remember diffusion is simply just the random motion of particles. So example, if we put ink into a thing of water, the water, the, the ink would just sort of diffuse out, okay. So it turns out we can use MRI. MRI can be sensitized to diffusion. And just to give you a sense of what that's like, remember that spins process at their local magnetic field, according to the local magnetic field. So we're gonna imagine two spins, A and B, and we have a presence of this gradient field, such that the field here is lower. So this is a lower field. Okay, this is, you know, zero, and this is, this is a slightly less lower field, less, you know, slightly lower. So we move out in this direction, spins are going to process at a slower frequency because the, the field is lower, so they're going to process at a lower frequency. So if we imagine diffusion of the spins, depending on where they go, they're going to acquire some phase. Okay. An experiment is such that then after some amount of time, we reverse the gradient. And now we switch it. So now this is a stronger field. So the gradient's going this way. So these are now, this is a stronger field. Delta B is greater than zero. So the spins will sort of reverse the phase that they've lost and regain it. Now, if they stayed in place, then this would totally reverse the spin. So if a spin went this way, then it would reverse and go back to zero phase if it didn't move. But since it's moving around and experiencing different parts of the magnetic field, it turns out that at the end of the day, the spins are sort of, um, out of phase. And that leads to a decrease in the MR signal, right? And so remember, the more out of phase spins get, the more the signal decreases. And so it turns out that that's proportional to diffusion. So the more things move around and sample different magnetic fields, the more dephasing there is going to be. You can sort of see this in this picture here. So what we're looking at here is a uh, different spin. So we might have some yellow spins, some, some uh, red spins, some blue spins. And you notice that they're gonna move around. So for example, this spin moves to here and uh, this spin, uh, this yellow spin moves to here, okay. So that as they're moving around, they're acquiring different phases. And at the end, you notice that they are quite out of phase. And so because they've moved around and, and experienced different parts of the magnetic field, and um, so that when we, we sum them up, there's gonna be a very large signal loss. And that's if we apply the gradient, we apply a very strong gradient to make the magnetic fields very different in different parts of the space, there's gonna be a lot of dephasing. We applied a weaker gradient, okay, here, then although the spins are still moving around the same amount, the, amount, the difference in magnetic fields that they're sampling is much less. So you can sort of see here, there's much less dephasing of the spins there's gonna be a smaller signal loss. Okay. So there's two things that come into play. And so the, the overall signal is related to uh, exponential of minus B times D 
where B is known as the B factor and D is the diffusivity. All right. And so one thing is we know, so if we make the gradients stronger, the magnetic fields are very different so that um, the signal is gonna go down the stronger we make those gradients. The other thing is if we wait longer before we try to refocus, then also the spins have moved, have a chance to move around much farther. And so that's also gonna to tend to um, uh, make the signal go down. And that's reflected in the B factor where the B factor depends on both that, how far apart those gradients are and also their strength, okay? So uh, one of the things we can use then is we can use this to detect certain types of diseases. So for example, this is what's, you talked a little bit about T2 weighted images in the course already. So this is someone who has some, a problem with their brain. But if we do it, if we, all we had is a T2 weighted image, maybe you could say that there's something different between the left and right, but it's maybe not too obvious. And, and maybe, you, you know, I, I certainly don't have the expertise to say whether there's something wrong. But if we apply diffusion weighting, we, it's very clear that there's something wrong with that part of the brain. And what's happening is the signal has gone up, okay? So remember the signal is proportional to E to the minus BD, okay? The B factor is something we control this. So this is what we control. The D is sort of the biology, right? And so in this case, the diffusivity has gone down, right? Because if I make this term smaller, then E to the minus BD will be a, a bigger number, right? It's E to the minus that, number, so if D is smaller, then there's less sort of um, uh, uh, sort of attenuation due to the E to the, the exponential attenuation. So what's happening is it, it turns out, so this is a person who actually had a stroke and a stroke, what ha happens in a stroke is uh, an artery gets clogged. And so oxygen is not delivered to uh, a certain part of the brain. And, and so that part of the brain uh, typically has tissue death. And so what happens is when tissues die, when cells die, water, tends not to diffuse as easily through the tissues. And so therefore the diffusion goes down. And in this case, the MR signal goes up, okay? So this is actually used quite a lot clinically in terms of if you, if you have a stroke, then you'll probably get some sort of diffusion imaging, um, especially if it's in chronic state. If it's an acute stroke, they may not have time to put you in the MRI system, in which case you'll get a CT scan and, and then uh, they might go straight to surgery. Uh, this is another case where, you know, you sort of see something on the T2 weighted image. Um, there's clearly something going on here, but whether how bad it is, it's not clear. Very clear on the diffusion weighted imaging. And if you look at the angiogram, which is the sort of map of their blood vessels, you sort of see that this person does have uh, an issue with the um, a blockage of a vessel. Okay, so why don't we do one of these polls? So let's do the first question here. So if we increase the amplitude of the diffusion gradients, then what will happen to the magnitude of the diffusion weighted signal? Will it tend to increase or decrease? Okay, 10 more seconds if you can just put in your responses. Okay, let's take a look. So most people said increase. So let's take a look at that. So let's go back to this slide here. So in this case, when we had a stronger gradient, Remember that led to more dephasing, right? More dephasing. So there is a larger signal loss. So in, in that case, so 
if, if, if it by increase, you meant larger signal loss, you'd be correct. Um, but the actual magnitude of the signal is less, right? I mean, the, the actual signal you measure is e to the minus bd would be less. So in that case, um, the actual magnitude of that signal would be decreased. So in that case, you know, probably both, you know, whether you said increase or decrease, probably you were, you were correct. But just to make, to clarify, well, by the magnitude of the signal, we mean the magnitude of this signal here, this e to the minus bd signal will increase or decrease, okay? So let's let's then actually do the other question just to sort of see if, if that helps understand the next question. So now we keep the magnitude of the gradients the same, but we just increase the spacing between them. So now the question is the signal we measure at the end of the experiment, is that signal level going to increase or decrease? Okay, so let's take a look at this poll. Um, once again, most people said it would increase. Um, so let's think about this. So if I have more time for the experiment to go on before I rephase my spins, then the spins actually have more time to go and sample lots of different magnetic fields. And so that's gonna tend to lead to more dephasing, okay? So the more time there is, so the time increases, right? Okay, so we decrease the spacing, right? So we decrease the spacing. So actually, yeah, so the time went down, right? Therefore, there's gonna be less time for dephasing of the spins. And therefore, yes, the signal level will go up. Okay, so yeah, so most, so it seems like um, the, the, most of you have the right picture in terms of what's gonna happen to the signal. Okay, so there's less time for dephasing, so therefore the signal does go up, great, okay. So, so far we just talked about diffusion in general, but what really makes it important for mapping is the fact that, you know, we've talked about isotropic diffusion where you imagine things diffusing equally everywhere. What's really interesting is anisotropic diffusion where there's a preferred direction for diffusion. And this happens, especially in the white matter tracks where it's easier for water to diffuse along the fibers than against the fibers, because when they try to go against the fibers, they're gonna run up against the walls. And so water can't diffuse as easily. So it turns out we can sensitize our uh, fMRI, our diffusion MRI signal to the um, diffusion direction by just applying the gradients in different directions, okay? So for example, if we wanna look at diffusion going left to right, we apply a gradient in the left right direction. If we wanna look at up down, we look at the if we want to look at diffusion in this direction, we can apply a gradient in that direction. So the FRI experiment is really only primarily sensitive to diffusion along the gradient direction. So that's shown here where this is, these are showing the direction of the gradient. So let's just look at these three. So if you look here, there's a lot of signal loss here along this direction. When the diffusion in this direction, you see a lot of signal loss here. And then when the, when the diffusion direction is here, you saw it, see a lot of signal loss in that direction. And so if you actually combine those three together, you could argue that the, the blood is probably, the, the, um, the, the diffusion is probably following that trajectory there, all right? So that's how uh, diffusion, what's called diffusion tensor imaging, DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, Basic idea is we're going to acquire, we're going to look at diffusion in lots of different gradient directions. And from that, you know, we're going to come up with this sort of ellipsoid representation of the diffusion. Now it turns out in 3D, you need to represent a 3D ellipsoid, you need at least six different numbers. 
And so that's represented by what's called the diffusion tensor where you have three, six unique numbers, okay? And from that, you can derive different eigenvalues and different eigenvectors where the eigenvalues tell you how long the axes are of the ellipsoid and the eigenvectors tell you which way they're pointing, okay? So remember for a, a three-dimensional ellipsoid, you can have three principal axes. These are the axes, right? And these are the lengths of the axes. And so for an isotropic voxel, if diffusion can go in any direction, then those eigenvalues are all the same. All the axes have the same length. So that's shown here. Whereas if you have an anisotropic diffusion, then one eigenvalue tends to be bigger. And so that principal axis will have that biggest eigenvalue associated with it and along the direction of that eigenvector. And so what we can do is for every box in the brain, we can use acquired data at different directions, gradient directions, and use that to come up with an estimate of these diffusion uh, spheres or ellipsoids, okay? And you sort of see in cerebral spinal fluid is the fluid that bathes your brain. Gray matter is where your neurons are. Those tend to be fairly isotropic, okay? Water diffuses fairly equally in those tissues. Whereas in the white matter tracks, all this, all this stuff here is wiring of the brain, okay? The wiring of the brain, you have very anisotropic diffusion. Uh, typically, even though we just need six directions, we typically acquire much more because it, it tends to make the uh, process less sensitive to measurement error. So typically you might do 30 or 40 directions to get a very good estimate of, of this ellipsoid. And so you can imagine if you had a lot of ellipsoids uh, in the brain, you could then think about connecting them uh, and sort of connecting the dots, sort of going along the principal direction. And so that's what's called tractography. And so you can sort of start making these nice pictures of how the wiring in the brain by just sort of following the principal direction of those ellipsoids. There's even more sophisticated techniques where just instead of the ellipsoids, you'll notice here we have actually what are called almost like these sort of very complicated shapes, right? Where there's not just an ellipsoid, but they're sort of showing two different directions. Because you can imagine in the brain, you might have two fibers that are crossing. So you're gonna have diffusion this way and that way. And so there's even more sophisticated methods where they can actually use that to resolve crossing fibers, you know? And, and so um, that's sort of the state of the art is how do you actually make this method better so that when, let's say you have two fibers crossing or three fibers crossing, you know which way the fibers are connected. So at the end of the day, with a lot of hard work, um, you can end up with these amazing images of the brain, of the brain's wiring. And, and I, I find this still quite amazing that this is, these are showing maps that you can acquire in eight minutes, 11 minutes, or 25 minutes. And this, are, this requires no injection of any agent. You simply put the person in the scanner, you do the diffusion MRI experiment, and then you analyze the data and you can come up with these tractography maps. Now you can sort of see even just putting someone in the scanner for eight minutes, um, you can actually get quite good uh, maps of the human wire, of, of the wiring of the human brain. And this really is not possible any other way. I mean, previously when people have looked at wiring in the brain, that is very invasive. You might take a sample, inject contrast agent into one area of the brain and see where it goes. And then you might have to, you know, decapitate the, the, um, the animal and then do some sort of tracing of, of how that agent moved. Um, so, in this case, it's really remarkable that, that MRI is actually offering a method that really, at, at least for now, doesn't really have any even competitor that you can, there's really no other way that you can actually safely map the wiring in someone's brain as, aside from using a diffusion MRI at this point. Um, so some interesting studies that you can do are, um, you can, for example, look at how the wiring changes with development. So this is at two weeks, one year and adult brain. And you can sort of see the wiring changes quite a bit um, over development as you would expect. As, as you're learning, as the brain is becoming organized, the wiring of the brain has to adapt to um, support that. Okay. So we've talked about fMRI and diffusion MRI, diffusion tensor imaging, and those are two, I would say two of the main pillars of current modern neuroimaging. One looking at function, the other looking at uh, wiring of the brain and con structural connectivity. And then the other pillar is the anatomical imaging that you've sort of already seen in the course, which is just looking, get, having very nice pictures of the brain, 
uh, so we can look at structure and, and how that structure might be changing. Okay, so in the last 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to switch gears and just touch upon something that, you know, um, in addition to applying methods, you know, people in the field are always trying to push the technology forward in terms of how do we go faster? You know, how can we acquire the images more quickly? From a clinical point of view, um, you're always trying to scan as quickly as possible. In some cases, the subjects are very sick. They may not be able to be in the scanner for very long. Uh, it's an emergency case. You may only, you know, you're trying to get this person and scan them as quickly as possible, make a diagnosis and then send them off for treatment. Um, and then even in research, um, you know, the faster you can go, the more effectively you can use your information, the better you are, especially in certain populations. So for example, if you're scanning little babies or children, uh, they tend to move around a lot. And so being able to scan more quickly is an advantage. But you want to scan quickly without giving up your image quality. And so that's been one of the main uh, sort of thrusts of development over the last 10 or 20 years is how do we actually do that? So you may have talked a little bit about sampling. So this is sort of an image and this is his Fourier transform. And so um, typically, you know, when we're specifying our image that we want, we'll specify what's the field of view in the X and Y direction and sort of what's the resolution size, you know, how big do we want our voxels? Those parameters then, then translate into how finely do we sample in K space? So what's our delta K? Also, how far do we go out in K space? You know, what's the, you know, how much data do we need to collect? We don't want to acquire too much data because it'll take too long. And we also don't want to sample more finely than we need to because it takes time to acquire those samples. So these are sort of like the, so like the Nyquist condition, right? that your sampling has to be finer than a certain criteria and also for a certain resolution you need to go up far enough okay so that's really dominated fMRI design you know up until about uh, the year 2000 so for the first um, say 20 years of, F of MRI we were really stuck with Nyquist rules and Fourier image um, and so what I want to talk about in the last uh, 10 minutes is really sort of how the field is shifting away from that and especially with deep learning, um, coming up with new ways of looking at how we do imaging. So just to remind you, um, if we're fully sampled and we meet all the Nyquist criteria, then you know we can go back from the image, the Fourier domain, and back again. Okay, so we have uh, a good-looking image and we have the full, full, full Fourier, right? Okay. So let's say this had some delta k. Okay. But now let's say we, um, so some sampling of delta K and, but now let's say in the Y direction, now we have two times delta KY. Okay, so it's two, so let's call this some delta KY. So we've doubled the spacing in the Fourier domain. So we're basically dropping every other sample in the Fourier domain. So that if you look at this image here, you can sort of see every other line is zeroed out. So we're missing data, okay? This leads to aliasing, okay? Which is not desirable. So that's not an acceptable image to have in a clinical setting. And so the question is, we'd still like to be able to do this, right? We'd still like to be able to skip every other line or, or not collect all the data because that allows us to go faster. But we want to do that and not have an aliased image. So the question is, how can we do that? So the overall philosophy is that when we design our fully sampled Fourier reconstruction, it's really designed to handle all possible images that you could ever acquire. So for example, if you have 32-bit images and you wanted 128 by 128 um, voxels in your image, then there are 70 trillion possible images that the Fourier transform has to be able to reconstruct, okay? If you wanted higher resolution like 512 by 512, then there's one quintillion possible images that the Fourier transform needs to be able to construct, okay? That's a very big space of images, but it turns out the space of biological images is much smaller than that. Right, we sort of biology has a certain structure to it, and so when we're looking at biology, when we're looking at the human body, we don't have to be able to reconstruct all of those one quintillion images. We only need to be able to reconstruct those images that look like biology. So we want to have our algorithms generate images that look like biological images, and we don't, you know, images that look like this are basically these are like biological images of other artifacts. 
we know that those can't those are not representing biology and so we want to take use of that knowledge and say hey let's design an algorithm that that really takes advantage of this knowledge that we know that our solution must lie in this yellow space and that's prior knowledge you know we can rule out these images these are not acceptable images and so our reconstruction algorithm should penalize those sorts of images and, and, and sort of say that's not really what the image is. The image should lie in this space of biological structures. So the, the initial attempt at that was something called compressed sensing. Um, and so in this case, for example, this is the Fourier domain, so Fourier. And in this case, we've downsampled. So we've randomly just thrown out a lot of the data. Okay. And if you use conventional reconstruction, you get a really bad looking image. Okay, that's not really an acceptable image. But if you just put some constraints and say, hey, you know, this image should satisfy certain constraints. Um, you know, it, it should have a certain uh, smoothness or some sort of sparsity. And it turns out you can do a very good job of reconstructing the original image, okay? With much less data and no obvious aliasing artifacts. So what that means is you're looking for a solution. You so the solution the, you want some estimate m hat. Okay, that's your image, right? Image estimate. And there's something called data consistency where you you want to say that you know at least the image I have is consistent with the data I've acquired. But it also has something else. You're also trying to minimize something else at the same time. And so in this case. You're typically trying to minimize uh, something that enforces sparsity. So this is using this donates something called the L1 norm, okay? And you just need to know that that tends to promote things that are sparse, where there's not too much, too many coefficients uh, in the signal representation. So it turns out, for example, if you take an image and go into, in this case, like the wavelet domain, that's considered a sparse transform. So that means that there's most of the coefficients in that transform space are zero or very close to zero. So you're looking for those images that also have sparse wavelet transform, right? And if you make that constraint, then you can sort of come up with these um, uh, ways where you can say, okay, even though I'm missing a lot of the data, I know the solution has to lie in this space where the, uh, the wavelet transform is sparse and therefore I can use that knowledge to make a good looking image. And so this is applied uh, here where they're showing, if you're fully sampled, you have this uh, image. If you just use a technical technique, you get this image. And if you use compressed sensing, you get a much better looking image, okay? Because they've taken advantage of the sparsity and, and, and it really works well with things, for example, like images of blood vessels, because those tend to be fairly sparse. You have a few blood vessels and the rest of the image tends to be of lower uh, image quality. Similarly, so what this allows you to do is you can go much, much faster. So for example, um, these are some images where these are, these images are acquired at, um, you know, 3.4 times accelerated. So that's, we have three and a half times less data. So we can go three and a half times as fast. And these images are acquired at uh, 6.4 acceleration. So where compressed sensing has really found a lot of interest is, for example, in imaging of pediatric patients. So a lot of the work has been done in, in people who really care about imaging very quickly. So if you're imaging a kid, if you can go six times as fast, that can be the difference between having an image that's usable and having an image that's not usable, simply because the amount of movement they make um, in, in the tiny scan is going to be greatly reduced. So that was where the field was until about five years ago. And compressed sensing was this very theoretically based method took a very long time to reconstruct, um, but there was still, it, because it had those advantages, there was still a lot of interest in it. Now we go to the next, what's happened in the last two or three years, the revolution has really been related to deep learning, right? I mean, obviously most of you have heard deep learning is changing pretty much everything. And, and it's certainly having a huge impact on how we look in terms of reconstructing images for medical imaging. And so here's the idea that typically, you know, what you've talked about in this course probably is, you know, you would do a Cartesian sampling of case space, and then you have some Fourier reconstruction. You can do, you know, similar for PET or CT, you've got some reconstruction algorithm, maybe it's back projection, filtered back projection. There's been a lot of work done over the last, you know, half, five decades on all these very sophisticated algorithms, and then, you know, designed by a lot of really smart people. Deep learning says, okay, 
you don't, and, and all those algorithms were based a lot on understanding the physics underlying what was going on. Deep learning takes a different approach. It says, I don't, the deep learning network knows nothing about the physics. It's just a deep learning network that takes a lot of training data. You train it on lots of images. Say so these are the sorts of things that are images and they don't even have to be medical images. Um, in this paper here that we're looking at, they just train it on image net data. So just images off the web and you just train it on those images and it learns to sort of reconstruct images pretty well. And so then when you give it MRI data, it still does a very good job, okay? So what it does is it figures out a mapping. So let's say this is the data you acquire. It figures out a mapping so this is like noisy data, okay? First of all, it figured out a mapping to say, well, you know, what I really need when I create images that look good, I want to sort of denoise the data a little bit. Okay, so first I'm projecting onto the, you know, the space of all images includes lots of noisy images. First of all, or the sp space of all data includes all noisy data. So first I want to project onto the space of fairly clean data, okay? Then I want to project onto sort of what's possible for this like possible image space, right? So there's some, some sort of lower dimensional space that says, well, you know, there's this transformation from my data into this lower dimensional space. And from that, I should be able to generate those images that are, you know, the prior knowledge, knowledge says are related to biological structures. It's a fairly simple network. You can sort of see here, it's got a few fully connected layers and just two convolutional networks. So these are fully connected layers. And these two are what are called convolutional neural networks. So using convolution to sort of um, uh, extract features from the data. And so the amazing thing is that this outperforms sort of even state of the art. And so what's shown here, the auto map is sort of this deep learning network and here, the conventional is comparing it to the best case scenario. And you can sort of see in all cases, it either does better or just as well as these conventional methods that in some cases have taken many, many years to develop and lots of sophisticated math. And without knowing anything about imaging, the auto map can do a better job. It can even do a better job when there's noise. And so for example, if we have a noiseless image here, and we, we just add noise to the data, then the conventional imaging gives you a rather noisy image, okay? But because the images that were trained on were not noisy, it knows that, you know, having a grainy looking image, the grainy part is really not part of the biology. So the auto map is able to come up with a, a sort of do a very good job of denoising because it basically gets rid of sort of the noisy parts of the data, okay? So this area of deep learning is still very active. People are still trying to figure out how to do it. Um, what we saw in the auto map was going directly from Fourier space or the sensor data directly to your image. But you can think of other algorithms where you can maybe do the inverse Fourier transform first and then go through deep learning network. Or you could go through the deep learning network first and then do your inverse Fourier transform. No matter what approach you take, one of the advantages is that the reconstruction time is very low. Okay, the training time can be very long, but that only has to be done once. Once you've trained the network, you can deploy it very easily. And the reconstruction is very quickly because you just need to, it's all feed forward. You just pass the data through all these weights and some nonlinearities. And that's with, especially with GPUs, that's very fast to compute. So this is an example where they're trying to use the deep learning network to go from an alias image to uh, a better looking image. And so the question is, can they do this? And it may, the interesting thing is if they just go from an alias image to their best guess, it doesn't do a very good job. And here they're missing a lot of the data. But in this case, if they just add one more look, sort of one more line of data, they can actually do very well. And so why that is, is still an area of investigation. And, and so I think what you're, certainly what you're gonna see over the coming years is, is much more use of deep learning for medical imaging. In fact, this year was the first year that the major manufacturers are having FDA approved products. Uh, this is, for example, the Air uh, Recon DL pipeline that GE Healthcare just um, sort of announced. Um, so what they found was, for example, using, so this upper row here is conventional, 
and this is deep learning down here. Okay. And what they're doing is as we're going along this way, they're sort of increasing the voxel size, the nominal voxel size. And you notice that as they increase that voxel size, the conventional image gets blurrier and blurrier and blurrier until over here, it's, it's, it's image quality is created quite a bit. Whereas with a deep learning, because it sort of knows what images should look like, it's able to keep the sharpness even as the resolution is being decreased. Um, this is an example where you can use deep learning to go faster. So you can get rid of, so for example, uh, this image was acquired in 127 seconds, right? Uh, and this was in 61 seconds. So half the image was acquired with half the amount of data. Um, but if you look at the image quality, it's arguably just as good and probably even better than the one that took longer. In this case, deep learning, without deep learning, the acquisition took 15 seconds. And with deep learning, it took 11 seconds. And so it's not, it's, it's, it's not only faster, but you could arguably, you could say it's a better looking, more diagnostically useful image. And the last example here is um, from Siemens, which is also sort of just this year announcing sort of their deep learning solutions. And you can sort of see here, they've, they've decreased the scan time from three minutes down to two minutes and 21. And so they're going faster and arguably the image quality is just as good and, and maybe even better uh, than the longer image. So I think we're certainly gonna see a lot more deep learning um, as time goes on. And uh, this is going to probably lead to much better uh, images in the sense that the, 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 the images will be much more robust to things that typically cause artifacts um, in typical uh, reconstruction, but the deep learning because it's trained on uh, these image data banks uh, seem to do a fairly good job. Now there's still more work that needs to be done in terms of does deep learning always do a better job? And some of my clinical colleagues are very skeptical. And, and I think there's gonna be much more work done in this area in terms of, you know, maybe what if deep learning screws something up or, or changes something, you know, what's the effect of that um, medical imaging? So um, let's see. So I just wanted to end. And what I'm gonna do is if you could um, go here to fill, I'll put this in the chat as well, fill out this lecture survey. It should take you a couple of minutes. That would be great. And um, if, for those of you who want to know more about any of these topics, uh, all our lectures from B2ADA, which is sort of a first level grad class that covers different types of medical imaging, is they're online on YouTube, as well as uh, a, a course I gave last year on fMRI. Um, if you want to know more about fMRI or diffusion MRI, uh, that's all uh, on the YouTube channel. And finally, uh, if you want to know more about MRI, mriquestions.com is one of probably one of the better um, uh, sort of uh, websites in terms of the, the person who wrote that is a former radiologist who has spent a lot of time um, sort of answering a lot of different questions about fMRI. Um, and so that's something that um, for those of you who want more about MRI in general, that's a really good resource as well. Um, so let me just type this in to the chat. So that's, you have a link in the chat and is also in, in the notes. Um, and then um, thanks for your attention and uh, happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you very much, Tom, for the very exciting lecture. Um, so any question? I think there's some question in the, uh, previously there's one question in the chat. Uh, yeah, I think that we, that's I, I think we met to all those real questions. Real-time uh, functional MRI, I think. Oh, was there? Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't see that. Uh, what was the question about real-time fMRI? Oh, you mean how do they do the, um, so uh, for the real-time fMRI, uh, oh yeah, I, I guess I probably answered the wrong question. So the real-time fMRI is simply, you know, you're given like there might be a bar that's showing if the signal is getting bigger or smaller. And you yeah. just ask to control the height of that bar. So the command might be make the bar bigger and then you try to make the bar bigger. And then the command is make the bar smaller and you ask to make the bar smaller. And so because your, your, you know, your, sense, your sensory system and your brain is like closed loop, it's just closing the loop and it's just like riding a bike. You're not really sure how to do it, but you're given the feedback and then you, your brain just figures out what to do. So it's not like you end up knowing what you're doing, but uh, your brain is smart enough to figure it out. 
do, do you have to correlate, you know, the uh, the boat signal with something that you, your mind can control? It's like you move your finger and then that can change the boat signal and then you build up this kind of link, first of all, right? Yeah, and I mean, there is training, right? I mean, it, it, does, it does improve with training. Uh, I think the problem is the effects are maybe not as strong as people would have liked when this when they first started doing real-time fMRI, there was a lot of hope that, hey, this, this could be the silver bullet where people could learn to, for example, control their addiction or control their pain levels. But I think it's just one of those things where um, there's a couple of things. One is it's probably, it's very expensive to do it, right? And you probably need a lot of training to do that. And so it's probably not that practical. The second thing I think you have to realize is that the brain is always adapting. Right. So if you let's say you figure out a way, let's say you have an addiction issue and you use this method to control your addiction cravings. Well, that might work for a while, but if some of the underlying causes are still there, the brain will find another way to to cause that craving. So I think that's that's another issue that, um, you know, like anything else. Um, uh, and I think that's one of the issues that we've had with, um, you know, dealing with a lot of issues with the brain is the brain is always adapting and it's very complicated. So if you just try to fix one part, then some other part will change. And, and so that's, that's been very challenging for people. Any other questions? Sounds like there's no more question. Uh, 